Okay, so the topic of today's lecture is kind of finishing up the material we're talking about on matting. And um, I want to kind of talk about three things. The first is there's been a lot of work in computer vision on what I would call just segmentation, which basically means um, trying to take an image and find the foreground as a puzzle piece that I can just take out directly. And the idea is if I segment the image into pieces, that those images, those pieces just kind of snap back together to form the whole. There's no alpha values, there's no fractional overlap or anything like that. Um, and so since there has been so much work in the vision community on that straight kind of hard segmentation problem, I just want to talk about that briefly and then mention how one successful matting algorithm kind of starts with the hard segmentation and then kind of upgrades it to a mat at the end. So that's one thing. The next thing is just kind of mentioning briefly about um, the real world. You know, how do you deal with matting for uh, video? I mean, so everything I've done so far here has been basically still image matting, but the problem visual effects artists have to face on a daily basis is video matting. And so I'll just kind of mention a little bit about the academic research on that and about kind of how it's done in practice in Hollywood, which are very different things. And then finally, I want to just talk about some extensions to the general matting setup. Um, you know, things that are kind of similar to matting, but are not exactly the same uh, formula. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is kind of like hard segmentation. And so the premise there is basically I have an image and I just want to kind of like chop it up into pieces, right? So I've got, you know, maybe I've got this foreground piece and I've got this other foreground piece, and I've got this foreground piece, and these are all basically like puzzle pieces. And so the idea here is that if I look at this as the foreground and all the other stuff as the background, that basically the foreground has, you know, alpha equals one, and the background has alpha equals zero, and there's no fuzziness at all, okay? Um, you know, and you can imagine this kind of thing is definitely very useful for, um, you know, things like just general image understanding, right? So I show you a picture and I want to pick out, okay, these are the people, this is a car, this is a bicycle. For that kind of thing, you don't really need to have um, soft, fringy edges on the, on the segments. And so probably the most popular underlying method for doing hard, and hard segmentation today is based on graph cuts, okay? So graph cuts is another one of those very, very useful generic, algor generic algorithms that it's good to know about um, in general. So um, many algos are based on, oops, many's, many algorithms are based on graph cuts. Okay. And so what is the setup for graph cuts? Okay. So here's how it works. The idea is, again, similar to the way we talked about last time, I have a set of pixels, okay? So I'm gonna draw that kind of like um, this plane here. And here the dots are gonna be the centers of the pixels. I guess I kind of made myself draw too many dots here. Man, I have to draw all these dots. What was I thinking? And these dots are kind of squished at the end. Okay, and these dots are pixel centers and they're connected by edges. And since we're only looking at hard segmentation, what we have to do is classify every dot as either foreground or background, okay? So the way this works is that we have a kind of a big node up here we call F for foreground, and we have another big node down here called B that we call background. And every one of these nodes is initially attached to both F and B. And this is where my kind of lines and dots are gonna get messy. So for example, this guy is attached to F and also to B. This guy is attached to both as well, and so on. So what I have is this big graph where I've got the original image and then I've got a bunch of extra lines that are all going to F and all going to B. And here is a uh, slightly better picture of that on the left here, okay? And so what is a cut? 
So what we want to do is we want to sever some of these edges so that at the end there is no path from F to B. So basically the idea is to entirely separate F, to B, F from B and the nodes that are still stuck to F at the end are the ones that are going to be classified as foreground and the ones that are stuck to B at the other end are the ones that are going to be classified as background. Okay, And so you can immediately see that you know, for every node at least for every node, one, exactly one of the F or B links has to be cut. Otherwise, there would be a path from F to B right through that node. Also, we have to make sure that we cut some of the edges through the image, because otherwise I could get from F to B through one of the you know, pixel to pixel edges. Okay? And so um, that's the basic idea. And so this dotted line, something that separates F from B, is called a cut. Okay? And that's why this is called graph cuts, is because you form this graph out of the image nodes, you put these two super nodes, F and B, at the end, and then you cut through the nodes to separate the two terminals. Okay? And so for those of you who have taken algorithms, you CS types, right? So have you seen this problem before? Or here the max flow problem? So basically, this is like one of these things that you probably would learn about in an algorithms type of course. Maybe you saw it in passing, but this is really something that we use a lot in vision. So let me say a little more about how this process works. So what do we mean by, so I said basically a cut, you know, separates F from B, no path between them. Right, but there are lots of possible cuts that do that. For example, I could just cut all the links that go from each pixel to F, right? Then F would be all by itself and everything would be B, right? So, you know, what I want to do is I want to find the best cut, right? And in some sense, so what I mean by best here is the one that kind of conforms the most to how we think the foreground and the background should be separated. And so what we do is we actually seek what's called the minimum cut. And what that means is that if I go back to my picture here, that means that what I do is I assign a weight to each of these edges. And then kind of the value of the cut, the cost of the cut, is what I get by adding up the cost of all the stuff that I cut. Okay, All the edges that I remove, I add up all their weights, and that's the cost of doing that cut. So I want to find the cut that minimizes that cost. And so basically each edge Um, gets a weight. And so for, you know, these are like, you know, weights between adjacent pixels. I'm going to call those IJ. And then you can also have weights from each node to the foreground and weights from each node to the background between each pixel and the terminals. And then the cost of a cut is basically the sum of, um, let's see how I wrote this here. So basically, um, I'm going to write this in kind of the same notation that I used for the book. So it's like saying for all the edges in the cut, including possible cases where J is the foreground of the background terminal, I sum up these weights. Okay. So I'm going to talk in just a second about how we generate these weights to make sense for this segmentation problem. Um, but, you know, this kind of problem was known in the um, kind of math community for a long time. People have been talking about graphs and cuts for many, many years. Um, but only recently in the computer vision community did, did people start to really think about, okay, how can we compute this minimum cut super efficiently and super quickly? And uh, there was a, a couple of people, Boykov and, Gol uh, Boykov and Jolie and also Kolmogorov, started to think about, okay, you know, for the kinds of graphs that we see in images, where we have images that are connected together in these grids and so on, you know, there are actually very efficient algorithms for computing the minimum uh, cut. And so... That's what 
led to this kind of explosion of interest in graph cut algorithms and computer vision kind of in the, I guess it was probably like the mid to late 90s. So um, how do we make the best cut line up with our intuition for uh, what a good segmentation should be? So here, again, let's go back to the idea of matting. So for the segmentation problem, we also let the user scribble on the image, right? So basically, let's look back at our image. So here, if this is my foreground, so I let the user kind of draw a white stroke on the foreground, and they draw some black strokes on the background. And that's kind of like the seed for this graph cut algorithm. And so the idea here is that, okay, well, let's think about these nodes here. So let's think about a pixel where I have a foreground scribble. Well, at that pixel, the first thing I want to do is I want to think about what should the terminal weights be? Well, clearly the weight from that pixel to the foreground should be infinite, right? Because I should never be allowed to cut that edge, right? I'm telling you, this is foreground, so there should be no way to make that non-foreground. And similarly, the background, you know, edge weight should be zero, right? That's like saying, I know you got to cut one of these two edges. You can never, never, ever cut the foreground edge, and it's super cheap to cut the background edge, right? Basically, no cost for the background edge. And the other way around for a background scribble. So again, we kind of reverse this for background scribble. I mean, in practice, you can't use actual infinity. You use some huge number to prevent the algorithm from ever considering it. Okay. Now, what about for the um, edges to the foreground and the background for places where we didn't scribble, right? So again, just in the same way that we did for matting, we can use the foreground and scribble, the foreground and background scribbles provided by the user to generate basically PDFs for probability of foreground color and probability of background color, right? So for uh, non-scribbled pixels, I use scribbles to build basically the probability of the foreground and the probability of the background, right? And this isn't really that different from the way that we generate similar probability functions for the matting problem. We kind of talked about this the last lecture and even the lecture before, right? And so one idea basically is to say, okay, so the weight from a node to the foreground, here's one uh, possible function. So let's think about what this means for a second. This is like saying, okay, you know, if the probability that a pixel is background is very low, right? That means that this number here is close to zero. That means that a, the log of some number that is really close to zero is really, really, you know, negative, right? And then the negative of that is really, really big, right? So if PB is low, then the weight to the foreground edge is really high, and kind of conversely for the weight to the background edge. And you can imagine that, you know, it's not required, but these things basically, if you imagine that they, you know, are in inverse relationship to each other, then this will make the weights kind of make sense, right? So the weights necessar won't necessarily be infinite anywhere, but they will be very, very large when the PDF for a given color is, you know, correspondingly low. Okay. So let me pause for questions. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the remaining question is, how do I assign the weights between the pixels? Well, um, between the pixels, that's pretty easy. One thing that I could do is I could say that the weight between the pixels is basically uh, e to the um, you know minus the difference between the colors, right? Again, that's like saying that if the colors are about the same, so if, if the colors are exactly the same, then that means that the exponent is zero, and I get e to the zero is one. If the colors are very different, then 
the thing inside the norm is large, and I get e to the minus some large number, and the weight is close to zero, and that means that graph is, that edge is appealing to cut, right? So this, this all kind of makes the sense that we're trying to build the edges in such a way that it's expensive to cut edges that are between pixels of similar colors, okay? And again, you know, this sigma basically says how much, you know, how wide do I want this Gaussian to be? How much do I care about, you know, pixel similarity, okay? And um, before I go to a picture, let me just say that um, this can also be turned into uh, an MRF kind of Gibbs energy. So last time we talked about an energy function that was of the form, you know, a data term and the smoothness term. And basically here, you know, to build this energy in this form, this is kind of where the weights on the foreground and background go, and this is where the weights between the pixels go. And the book gives the specific details about how I transform, you know, one type of cost function into the other type of cost function. All that means is that, in theory, then, I could take basically any algorithm that I have for optimizing MRFs, and I could apply them to this problem, too. So it's all kind of the same idea. Okay. So let me just pause briefly to show you a um, example of how this works. And let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. Oh, nope, yeah, I can't. Okay, so let's look at, take a look at the top graph. I'm sorry that these numbers are so small, but basically the idea here is that um, how would I actually um, find this cut? Again, I'm not here to teach you about algorithms necessarily, so this is a famous algorithm called the ford fulkerson algorithm, and if you took algorithms, maybe this rings a bell somewhere. The basic idea is that Again, I can think about the weights on the edges as representing some sort of a capacity for pushing something through the network, like pushing fluid. And so the idea is you can imagine that I'm trying to push as much as I can from F to B, okay? And so what I could say is, okay, what I'm gonna do, the way the Ford Fulkerson algorithm kind of works is it's saying, okay, I'm going to just randomly find a path from F to B that is not full yet, that still has some capacity. And so for example here, you know, what I'm, when I click once, this is like saying, okay, the red path, you know, is not at capacity yet. In fact, I don't think it's at capacity because I haven't started to push stuff through the network yet. As soon as I find such a path, I fill it up as much as I can. And so, for those of you who can't see in the back, the left-hand edge has capacity three, and the other ones have capacity four, and so what I do is I push three units of stuff through that edge, okay? Then I randomly find another edge. Here's the bottom edge. The units here are uh, two, four, and five, and so the most I can push through that edge is two, so I push stuff at a level of two. I find another one, and I say, okay, this guy, I've got zero out of six, zero out of five, two out of four, and two out of five. So the only stuff I can push through here is two more units through this two out of four branch. And then I find another edge, and I say, okay, here I've got two out of six, zero out of three, zero out of two, four out of five, so I can only push one more unit through here. And at that point, if I were to search through all the possible paths, I would say there's no more paths where the edges are not, you know, where the, where the path is not at capacity. So when I'm done, basically if I look at this, I can separate the, um, you know, the source from the terminal based on, you know, how much residual stuff there is left between the, um, you know, between the edges. So kind of here you can see that, you know, there's a lot of details I'm leaving out. For example, how do I search over the you know, paths to find one that's not full? How do I know when I'm all done? Uh, how do I do this in some sort of efficient way? And so that's in some sense what the virtue of the Boykov algorithm was, is it showed that for certain kinds of graph structures that come up all the time in computer vision problems, there's a very smart way of choosing the next path and making sure you're doing it the right way. And so suddenly this problem that may seem on the surface to be very complicated can be solved actually very quickly on your computer. And so that's exactly what you're doing on this homework is running this code on your own. Okay. So how does this relate to, um, so, so this is basically the idea for segmentation. And so um, actually let me just show you an example of, uh, of how that works. So here is a example of image segmentation using this. And so the idea here is what I do first is I, um, 
outline the object of interest. Okay. And so when I do this, what I'm saying is, okay, everything outside of this is never going to be labeled as foreground, right? This is for sure the foreground is enclosed inside this box. And so that gives the algorithm a seed for the foreground and the background distributions. And so when I do the foreground segmentation, it's going to build the foreground and the background PDFs. And when it's done, it's going to hopefully not crash. It's going to give me something that actually does a pretty good job of, if I kind of put this overlay on, this kind of shows the segmentation. And you can see that you know this actually worked pretty well on the first try. right? Um, now, if I were to look at this carefully, I would say, okay, well, there's this little bit of, uh, you know, tree here that is not part of the koala. I did almost, I did pretty well almost everywhere else. If I look at the foreground, there's a little bit of crud here that I can get rid of with some sort of like morphological operation, but that's not so bad either. Again, one thing to keep in mind about graph cuts is that there is nothing that forces the foreground pixels to be a continuous blob, right? Because you know, the, the graph cut algorithm doesn't know anything about the object topology. So you may get, you know, weird things. And I'll show you a couple other examples in a second. So if I wanted to get rid of the um, background part, the nice thing about this graph cut algorithm also is that I can always re-scribble to refine things, right? So it turns out that once I have an initial segmentation, it's very easy to go in and adjust it without having to do the whole problem again from scratch. And so, for example, this interface lets me scribble. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this little blue mark on this background pixel, and then the graph cut algorithm runs and updates. And you can see now this little, you know, tan part has has gone away, right? And so, you know, you can see why this is so popular. It's really slick and easy to use, right? Now, life is not always so good. Uh, let me try another image. Um, so here. Let's try this guy. So again, first thing I do is I outline the foreground. And I guess I hopefully didn't cut off this guy's shoe too much. Maybe I should redraw this a little bit. OK. So when we do this, we're going to see that life is not so good, right? So the first segmentation, we missed the guy's leg. We missed the guy's head. And so we're going to have to do some more scribbling here. And again, here I've got my foreground scribble brush, and I just say, okay, hey, these pixels are all foreground. And you can see that, you know, kind of it's recomputing the segmentation on the fly just from my little scribbles. The hat is going to be harder. So if I say this, you know, I'm only getting a little bit of chunk of his hat. So I would have to actually do some fairly, you know, detailed scribbling to try and get the entire hat. And again, part of this is because there's nothing that forces the segmentation to be contiguous. And so, and again, his head is so similar to the color of the wall that, um, you know, that's going to be a pretty tough problem. And let's see, what else we got? This photograph of a <laughs> 1970s stock couple. This kid doesn't look like he's old enough to drink. So if we do this, here I missed his entire head and I missed his you know, pants. And you can also see there's some background that's inside of his sleeve. So here, I would need to scribble on my foreground brush, but it doesn't take much. If I scribble on his head, oh, maybe I shouldn't have been so fast to say that. Right? So here, actually, I'm getting like kind of whole chunks of his head as soon as I scribble. So it didn't take me more than a few strokes to get his entire head. Uh, to get his pants, you know, again, I kind of just randomly draw over here to say this stuff is, you know, the right color. You know, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but I mean, it looks like it's getting there. And then if I wanted to get rid of the background between his arm and the background, because there's this kind of highlight, I would kind of draw this little pixel here. But now I have to say, oh, you know, his arm is not here anymore. So, so there's a little bit of iterative back and forth to get what you're looking for. But I mean, this is still a lot better than trying to manually crop this out with you know, a uh, tool in you know, Photoshop, like kind of going around the edge of the sky. OK. OK. So, um, so that's the basic idea behind straight out hard segmentation, OK? So now, how does this apply to matter? Well, the idea behind that is that once we've got this hard segmentation, we could use it to help us build a pretty good tri map. So going from a hard segmentation to matting, the way that would work would be Initially, I have a 
um, you know, hard segmentation. And then what I would do is I would kind of procedurally just kind of fatten up this boundary, both on the outside and the inside, and I would say, okay, now everything inside here is for sure foreground, everything outside here is for sure background, and then this here becomes my uncertain trimap region, right? And if you wanted to get fancy, you could do things like, you know, try and kind of dynamically estimate how wide that region should be based on some sort of image statistics. Um, so then what you can imagine you're doing is, another way to think about this is since this is kind of procedurally generated from the hard segmentation outline, you can imagine that what you're doing is between kind of lines that are perpendicular through the original boundary, right? What you could do is you could imagine that what I have to do here is I need to estimate a, um, a function that goes from the foreground side to the background side kind of smoothly, right? And so you could kind of reduce the problem in a kind of a similar way to say, okay, what I need to do is I need to estimate what the kind of alpha profile is along each little strip normal to the boundary that I got from the hard segmentation, okay? Um, and so that's kind of like, I have a better picture of that here. This is our koala. So kind of like this, right? Where again, here you kind of see that I'm fattening up the boundary. I've got the gray region that now becomes the unknown alpha region. And I need to fit something like this profile to that unknown region. And so this is the foundation of an algorithm called grab cut. Grab cut is definitely very popular in the Madden community. Um, and it actually operates basically um, like I just said. And similar to the picture I, I showed you uh, in that little interface where first I draw a rectangle, that rectangle generates what's called the garbage map, meaning that everything outside of it is for sure background. There's this kind of a automatic iterative process inside GrabCut to refine the foreground and the background distributions. Then I end up with a hard segmentation that I present to the user. Everyone you know, is happy with that. And then I estimate the kind of profile width along the uh, kind of perpendicular, the normal to the boundary. Okay. Um, now that's probably not gonna work very well for images where the matting problem is really hard, things like wispy hair and stuff like that, where you know the alpha is not like this nice, simple function of the boundary, right? So I mean, this only really works for things that are like motion blur. This would probably work pretty well for um, where the where the blurriness is not due to kind of any inherent wispy structure, but it's more due to something that is smeared across from the foreground to the background. Um, but it is definitely fun to play with. Okay, so any questions about that? Yeah. Oh, so how would I estimate the, the right? So that's basically the question of how do I estimate these distributions here from the scribbles? Yeah. So basically, what I would do there is I would um, let me just draw it on a separate page. So what I would say is, okay, I have it's actually similar to what we did for Bayesian matting in some sense, right? So basically, I have a bunch of labeled samples in the RGB space, right? So that's, uh, that's like saying that I have these are my F samples from the scribble, right? And then what I could do is I could model this by a you know, 3D ellipsoid where I kind of have this is my mean and then my sigma comes from the shape of it. Or I could do something that was a little bit more non-parametric, like if you've heard of you know, um, Carroll density estimation or Parson windows or anything like that where I could have a non-parametric density estimate, I could do that too. But if you imagine the simplest thing to do would basically be similar to, if you remember back to lecture two on Bayesian matting, we said we could model this by a single ellipsoid or multiple ellipsoids, right? Gaussian mixture model, something like that. So Gaussian mixture model is probably the most natural thing to do, yeah, a so bunch of ellipsoids. Basically assume it's a Gaussian and then just right. uh, do a parametric. Right, or well, a mixture model is more like saying, I assume that there are multiple Gaussians and I fit the best right. Gaussians yeah. I can, right, yeah. Other questions? <laughs> 
Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, video matting. Okay. So video matting is really much. So like I said, this chapter especially, you know, we talked about all this cool kind of automatic natural image matting stuff, but the fact of it is that very little of this is used in Hollywood. So I don't want to imply that it is. Um, and a big reason for that is that it's very important that when you do a, uh, so, so basically, you know, sometimes if you're reading like a special effects book, um, you'll hear this called something like a traveling mat. Right, what that means is that the mat is changing from frame to frame. I'm going to put a question mark here about whether there should be two L's in traveling. Um, and so that actually is pretty tricky. I mean, here's, here's like a picture of a pathological you know, matting problem. Hummingbird, right? Hummingbird is flying around. You want to make sure that the mat is constant from frame to frame. That would be like killer matting problem. No one will want to do that. <laughs> um, but again, there are, first of all, there are some connections between this problem and um, what I would call visual tracking, right? So I mean, in my computer vision research, we do stuff all the time about like tracking objects as they move through a scene, right? And you can imagine you can kind of do the same thing. If I knew that here was the foreground in one scene, I could track it around as it moved through the scene. So kind of this is, you know, related to, but not the same as um, visual tracking. And so visual tracking is kind of like, you know, if you've ever done any, you know, kind of uh, computer vision stuff, you know, a lot of times you have like a guy who's walking through a scene and the goal is basically to draw a box around this guy in every frame, right? So, you know, that there's been a lot of work on doing that for cars and for people and so on. Things are pretty good. But, you know, that box, as, as you know, is not going to help us at all for a matting problem, right? I mean, that box is not a good mat, uh, especially if it's like a, a one in the box and zero outside the box. Best case scenario, maybe you could get some sort of like a ellipsoid around this guy, maybe, and you, you know you could try to do some sort of a fine segmentation of this person, but you know that's that's pretty tricky. Most of the time, you just see this box. Um, another thing that is related to visual tracking is um, kind of an older, like early '90s term called layered motion, and so layered motion is kind of related to. Well, so do you remember like the old school side scroller video games, right? Where basically you've got the background that's moving on one layer and the foreground sprites that are moving on another layer. That's kind of the idea is you want to take apart a video sequence into different layers that are ordered so that you know what's in front of what, right? So the idea basically is that you know, there's a very famous layered motion sequence where you've got a, um, you know, you've got a, a garden and you've got a tree and um, you know, as the car drives past this tree, you could say like, this is layer one. You know, the road is layer two, and maybe there's a house off in the distance that is layer three, right? And so what you try and do is you try and draw outlines around. Again, this is still a hard outline. You draw these hard outlines around regions of pixels, and you try and make sure that those outlines, uh, number one, match up with what the actual final image looks like, and number two, that they that they have some sort of temporal coherence, right? That's important. And so, um, you know, layers should be temporally coherent. And in some sense, you know, the idea is that the motion that you see is what gives you the hint as to what the layer should be, right? So you can kind of say, okay, the, you know, the foreground objects move by my car window faster than the background objects, right? And so I can look at the speed of pixels at every point of the image, and I can use that speed to kind of cluster objects into close to me or far away from me. And that problem is actually very much like what you call the optical flow problem. So we're going to talk about optical flow a lot in chapter five. Basically, the idea there is that for every pixel in the world, we want to estimate a low velocity vector. And so layered motion is something that you could do by kind of clustering those velocity vectors together into, you know, chunks. And again, there's kind of a, you know, there are interesting questions there about, you know, what is the right number of layers, right? Who's to say that, you know, this tree shouldn't be kind of like, you know, composed of two different pieces, right? How do I automatically estimate the number of layers? All that kind of stuff, they're kind of interesting problems. But again, those things are not really 
super useful for um, for matting. Okay, so some people did, um, you know, think about kind of uh, temporally coherent alpha mats. Right. So just in the same way that we have kind of like this notion that between adjacent pixels, you know, that my alpha between these pixels should be similar. You could also imagine that I do this in a temporal sense, right? So I also kind of say, okay, you know, not only should my alpha be similar to my neighbors here and here in space, but they should also be similar in time, right? And so you could imagine that you could formulate some sort of a huge kind of multidimensional, instead of trying to estimate the alpha mat at every point in time, you could estimate the alpha mat um, kind of all at once for the entire video, which, which, you know, I should hasten to say doesn't really work. So, I mean, we shouldn't think that this is something that is commonly easily done. And again, you could do the same thing for the, for the estimated foreground, the estimated background. You could try and estimate, you could try and enforce temporal coherence in all dimensions, right? Um, another thing that you could try doing is basically taking the alpha mat at one time, right? So basically I'd say I have the alpha at time t, and I could estimate the uh, optical flow between this image and this image, and kind of use that to push my alpha values over to the next frame, and then refine them, right? So that's, again, kind of a common thing to try to do is Optical flow, as we'll talk about uh, in a few lectures, is used all the time in computer vision. So I can get an estimate of how the motion vectors look, and then I could say, okay, well, I estimated my alpha really well here. Why don't I kind of push the alpha mat forward into the next frame and then make little changes if I need to? You know, again, there has been some work on that, but nothing that I would say is, like, incredibly successful. One thing that has been successful, as a, as a side note, is um, so there's... Something that's kind of related to, to you know layered motion and visual tracking called rotoscoping. So if you're if you're in the animation industry or in the visual effects industry, you learn a lot about rotoscoping or you hear a lot about rotoscoping or roto. So um, rotoscoping or roto basically means that I have an object in frame one and I draw a contour around that object. And then, you know, I push that into future frames. And so, you know, again, this is more of an animation thing, but if you think about keyframes, right? So the idea is basically you have an animator who is, you know, kind of drawing a really nice contour in one keyframe, right? And then maybe 15 frames later, they draw another really nice contour where the object has moved, and the hope is that you can kind of, you know, uh, hypothesize what that contour should be in the intervening frames. You don't have to actually hand outline every frame, right? And so, um, you know, there was a great paper by Agarwala, you know, that, that basically helped the animator, well, so basically it was like computer-mediated rotoscoping, where basically the animator would draw some stuff in some keyframes, and then the computer would fill in the middle parts, and then if you didn't like what you saw in the middle parts, you could either kind of drag the little contours around and refine everything, kind of in a similar kind of modification way to restroking. Um, you know, so that is something that, that animators are doing all the time. And so, unfortunately, uh, a huge amount of visual effects work is what they call roto, right? So basically, um, and I think, you know, I don't want to, um, well, I'm not a visual effects artist, so I shouldn't really say, but I believe that when people say a shot is rotoed, they're kind of generally meaning also the problem of not just the hard cut, but also the alpha mat that goes along with every cut, right? And so that's really the first job of when, when a shot comes in, someone has to start doing the alpha mat for the foreground object in that shot. And there's whole roto departments in animation studios or, or movie studios that are devoted to this very tedious problem. And like I said, you know, a lot of the algorithms we talked about can't really be directly applied for a few reasons, right? One is that they are not video algorithms, right? They're not temporally coherent algorithms. And also, they certainly don't work at frame rate or at frame sizes that are common to the movies, right? So if you look at the 
pieces of software that you're downloading for homework one, you know, they only work on like maybe 700 by, you know, whatever uh, frames. And so like, you can't put a 4K movie image into an algorithm like that and expect it to work. It's just not gonna work. Um, so I actually really encourage you to read the last section of this chapter, which kind of contains some interviews with visual effects artists about the difference between the stuff we learned in this chapter and the way it's done in reality. And so now that you know a little bit about how the matting algorithm works, um, you know, basically um, the way that it's done in practice is kind of a, a combination of whatever works for a given shot, right? It's not like there's some sort of magic matting tool that everyone uses in the industry. Basically, you know, I thought one really interesting observation was that you're not necessarily trying to get one algorithm that works on the entire image and then you're done. What you may do is you may say, okay, you know, here is a, um, you know, poor rendition, but, you know, here is a, you know, a Muppet or something that is moving in this direction, right? And so maybe you say, okay, you know, on this part of the Muppet, maybe I would do like a little bit of a manual segmentation around the front of the Muppet saying, okay, all the, all the stuff here that I need to mat out is really more due to motion blur or, you know, kind of, you know, soft edge than anything else. And so maybe I use matting algorithm number one over there, right? And again, what's happening is that, you know, for natural image matting, they're probably doing things like trying to, you know, switch out different color channels and plug them in and out and weight them in different ways in order to find something that gives them the best map they can there. But then for the wispy hair, they may have a whole different algorithm that's running on the wispy hair. And so what they try and do is they build up the final mat out of something that works on pieces of the object. And so um, that kind of involves, you know, a lot of back and forth between frames, making sure that the whole mat looks good as you toggle back and forth across the whole video clip. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about this. What was it? Um, yeah, so in some sense, the final mat is kind of like a composite of, of pieces. Uh, and of course, you know, ideally you would like to plan the shot in such a way that the matting algorithm or the matting effort on the visual effects artist side is reduced, right? You know, someone says basically, you could save me half a million dollars of post-production work if you just threw up a green screen behind this actor. But again, that's not really the way that the business works, right? You know, you get what you get from the, you know, from the, from the set and then you have to deal with it, right? Um, okay, so like I said, the sad fact of it is that, you know, definitely there are lots of semi-automatic algorithms for, you know, for, you know I, th I think the blue screen matting and blue screen video matting works pretty well. Well enough that there's not like a lot of crazy tweaking you have to do to pull somebody off of a blue screen, even if it's in video. And as you saw for like the TV shows that I showed you on lecture one, there were, you know, that kind of stuff is endemic in TV. You don't have time to do great detailed, you know, maths for broadcast television where basically what, the, you know, they're working on the shot the week before you see it on your TV screen, right? They don't have the time to do all this fine detail stuff. So that, that part is fairly well down, I think. But for video matting, again, that part is, is very laborious. And so actually, let's take a look at, um, you know, let me actually go back here for a second. So let's take a look at some of these scenes. Now you can kind of think about what would make these easier, hard matting shots, right? So for example, here, you know, you've got this guy with hard edges on the blue screen. That's probably gonna be pretty easy. And then here there's this blur, and you're probably gonna have some sort of confusion from the fact that the, that the suits have some blue on them that you can get rid of with some sort of like morphological operations to say that I know this is a contiguous foreground. So this, this is probably, you know, not like killer, although not great. This is the shot I showed you from source code. Again, this is pretty tricky, right? With this wispy hair, that's gonna be, you know, I mean, you, you can probably do okay with the green screen, but still there's gonna be some extra work involved. And also one thing to re look at in this shot in particular is that, you know, this is an example of a shot that doesn't really satisfy the matting equation, right? In the sense that it's not like every pixel is a combination of foreground color and background color. In this case, we've also got this kind of room light that is coming from behind the people that is kind of lighting up the outer boundary of their hair, right? That rim light is not part of this alpha matting model, right? So if you wanted to develop an automatic algorithm for this, in some sense, you'd have to have some sort of a third component that would have something to do with, with lighting, right? And that would be a really complicated thing to do um, you know, automatically. 
So here's a shot. This is a shot from Iron Man 2. You know, they have this whole thing that takes place at the Stark Expo that's, you know, this is in Queens, right? This is Flushing Meadow. So this is the actual environment, and this is the Iron Man version of it. And you can see that there's been a lot of stuff changed, actually. In fact, it seems like almost the only thing that's the same is this big globe in the front. Um, they've added a lot of stuff. I mean, you, you can see they kept some of the freeway in the back. They kept some of the buildings in the back. But lots of stuff has been changed. And so if you think about the effort that it would take to rotoscope out this, this globe in every shot, I mean, that would be like just such a pain, right? All this lattice work and so on. I mean, that would be just a lot of work for somebody. And so, I mean, again, what would you do instead? So actually, one thing that's really interesting that, that you wouldn't really think about is that in some cases, it's easier to just like, if the math's not working, just throw out that whole part of the object and generate it in computer graphics and put it back in, right? So for example, here, I think it would be a lot easier to model this globe as a new 3D object and just smack it into the shot, right? Instead of trying to like tediously, you know, mat around the little interstices of the globe. So like, there's a very interesting, I was reading something about, um, it's kind of more, more related to the chapter three stuff, but like, for example, um, in gravity, right? So there's a famous shot from gravity where Sandra Bullock is hanging in the air in that space station. So it's like this striking kind of iconic shots on all the posters, right? And so in that shot, you know, um, I should see if I can scan it in here. So basically, you know, she's actually being kind of held in this weird kind of brace where her, one of her legs is in this kind of rigid mount and she's kind of on like a little kind of bicycle seat kind of thing to keep her balance. And so in that shot, like one of her entire limbs at least is computer generated. Like it's not her actual body. They just kind of went in and redid her body to, to make it work, right? And so that's actually not uncommon is to actually go in and say, okay, this is too hard. Let's just be, let's just make it in computer graphics entirely, right? Um, this is the shot I showed you again. And so now you can imagine that this shot from Flags of Our Fathers would be a very difficult natural image matting problem. I mean, imagine trying to run the algorithm I just showed you, the graph cut algorithm on this, right? So you can imagine I would be stroking until, you know, kingdom come to try and separate these foreground rocks from the background environment, right? I mean, that would just be really tough to do. Um, and here's one, this is again, this is a real natural image matting problem from some sort of like motocross thing. So again, this thing here without people in stands was the original shot. And then they want to make it look like there are people in the stands. And so in this case, there's no green screen. You know, someone had to go in and separate out the motorcyclist from the background and put them in the zoo background. So again, you got motion blur and you got the fact that like all the seats are red and so is parts of the motorcycle. I mean, this seems like a really grungy kind of problem for someone to have to solve. You got, I guess, at least in this case, it's pretty good that you don't have like, well, you can see they actually kind of replaced, I think they replaced the wheel maybe entirely. It's hard to tell because like to have to try and to do anything inside the wheel where you've got spokes and stuff, oh, nightmare. So, you know, all this to say that there, you know, I don't know what the percentage would be. We should talk to some producer to see what they say, but like a huge amount of visual effects post-production work is just spent on this kind of problem, rotoscoping out foreground and, and putting it on new backgrounds, okay? Um, and so, you know, I think that there are people who are really good at it, and at the same time, it also may be one of the first kinds of jobs that you may have to get if you come in at the entry level is to say, okay, you know, here's your shot for the day, work on these four seconds of video and get it done to us by the end of the day, right? So, um, okay. So let me talk a little bit about um, extensions to matting, okay? Um, because that everything, so the rim lighting that I showed you in that source code example is one example where this isn't really 100% the matting equation that we talked about earlier. And so let's look at uh, a couple things. So here's one. This is not quite a matting problem, right? But it's kind of tantalizingly close, right? This is a shadow cast on a surface, right? And so you, imagine, you might imagine that you could do something similar where you say, okay, you know, I try to separate the foreground from the background. But in this case, you know, the pixel colors do not satisfy that matting equation that comes from a model of kind of mixing of foreground color and background color. Right? There is no foreground color as such. I mean, the shadow itself doesn't really have a color, right? It's not like the shadow is a black object that is being mixed with the uh, background, right? If you think about the way that light actually works, that's not really the way it works. And so 
Uh, so this would be pretty tricky, but there have been some people who have worked on basically kind of like automatic shadow removal, you know, uh, which is actually kind of a neat problem. You can imagine that you could develop similar kind of stroke-based algorithms where you say, okay, this is, you know, the shadow region, this is the background region, see if you can find me the foreground and the background, and then the question of how do you remove the shadow to make it look like the background is actually kind of an interesting problem of how do you kind of keep all the texture inside the shadow but change the kind of color of it, right? That's really what you want to do is you want to change all of the colors inside here to somehow be lighter and to match up with the, you know, with the true background, right? Um, so that's kind of an interesting, you know, problem. You definitely can't, you know, so you definitely also can't think about it in the same way, you know, for, for matting, usually what we want to do is we want to take the foreground off and we want to put it into some new background, right? So in this case, we can't like take the shadow off and put it on some new background because a shadow deforms in a way that depends crucially on the geometry of what it's falling onto, right? So if I look at my shadow on a wall, it's a lot different than my shadow on a flight of stairs, right? And so to really recomposite the shadow in, if that's really what you wanted to do, you'd have to actually know a lot about the 3D geometry of the, of the scene. So here's another like pathological problem. So here, let's think about this glass of water, right? So if I look at the scene with glass and the scene without the glass, you can see that this is not like a, you know, foreground background problem. Like if you look at these fish inside the glass, you can see that, you know, here the fish are swimming to the left and here the fish are swimming to the right, right? So there's like this image reversal that, that happens. Uh, you know, there's also this weird, you know, compression and stretching and reflections and stuff. So like, this is totally not a matting problem, right? And, and so, you, there, but ha there have been some interesting uh, papers on, suppose I wanted to take this glass of water and put it into a new scene, right? So there's a interesting body of work called environment matting, where again, for this you really need to have access to the object that you care about. But the idea is that I could put this glass of water in front of a computer screen and I could put lots of different patterns on the computer screen and I could see how they deform through the foreground object. If I knew exactly what the background was and I see what the foreground is, I can use that to build what's called an environment map, which kind of tells me how background should diffract and reflect through some optically active object like a glass of water. And so then I could take that glass of water and the environment model and I could put it somewhere else where it looks really good, right? Um, and that's actually kind of neat, but again, that's something where you need to have a lot of access to the scene. It's kind of like the equivalent of the triangulation method we talked about for getting ground truth maps, where you have to have lots of full control over the object that you care about. Um, but that was actually kind of a neat thing. Um, here's a kind of a case where, again, we kind of assumed that we always had, well, this is kind of the, the reverse of triangulation in some sense, right? So here's an example where I've got an image that has a flash and no flash, right? So this is the flash image and this is the no flash image, right? And so if you look at it, actually the only th places where the image really changes other than little background changes is on the foreground object, right? The background is basically the same color because the flash doesn't reach all the way to the house in the background, right? And so if I look at the difference between these images, I get something that is like a little bit of a hint of where the foreground mat should be. And so there's this thing called flash matting, where basically you look at the foreground, you look at the flash image, the no flash image, and then the difference, and you use that difference image to help you build a good alpha mat for the fuzzy object, right? So again, there have been some kind of cool papers on where you, um, you know, have a special camera that flashes and then doesn't flash like in quick succession. So you basically get two almost perfectly aligned images and that doesn't necessarily take as much effort to, you know, to undo the matting. This is a straight difference image? This here is a straight difference image, yeah. Yeah, and you can see, you know, I mean, and it works pretty well. Um, there's, you can see actually on the sides of this image, so here, since I took this in my backyard and there are trees that are moving around and so on, you can see that I'm getting some motion that's not due to the foreground. But, you know, almost all the difference is in the foreground region, right? Um, yeah, the clouds also didn't play much of a role, it seems. I mean, I guess because they're, you know, not too different. Yeah. So that's kind of a neat, you know, a neat idea. Um, and so there have been lots of other kind of even more advanced ideas in this. So again, the idea, one, one idea is called defocus matting, where you have uh, 
an array of cameras that all kind of share the optical path. And you have one camera that's kind of like, what was, basically you focus the cameras at different depths. And so the idea is that, you know, in one image, foreground objects are sharp and the background objects are blurry. In one image, the background objects are sharp and the foreground images are blurry. And you kind of use these different focus levels to help you understand what's close to the camera and what's far away from the camera. And you use several images to, to do that, right? Um, yeah, so there are lots of kind of interesting, you know, again, if you had all the time in the world and all the equipment in the world, then you can do some really high quality stuff. In fact, since we have a little bit of time, let me just show you um, if we just look at environment matting. <laughs> all right, I think we have to narrow this down a little bit. So here's an example. Let's see if the, I guess this is not on uh, YouTube, but we can. Oh, my video resolution is too low because of the way I'm recording this. So let's look at the paper. Um, so here, kind of, this is an example of, you know, the glass of water here is being composited onto two different backgrounds. And it looks good in both of these backgrounds, even though you know um, you never actually saw the glass of water there. So let's see some of the details. So here you can see their system, right? So they have a camera, and then they're showing. You can see this is a pretty old paper because these are not like flat screen monitors, right? So <laughs> you can see that they're basically shining patterns of light into the object from different angles and using that to build this map of how pixels from the environment get warped through the object. And so these are some of the examples of objects that they use, you know, these really complicated, uh, you know, vases and frosted glass sculptures. You know, you also have to pay attention to not just the way that geometry changes, but also the way that color can change through the object, right? So basically there's a color aspect here where they've got three different objects that are, so I guess here on the left, this is like, you know, this image is like bad crummy mat, right? And this is, I think, a comparison between their automatic algorithm of doing it and a real photograph taken with the same background. And you can see that, that their <laughs> algorithm does a great job of predicting what it should look like. Let's see what else we got here. Again, this also works for things that are not just clear, but also things that are like uh, reflective. Like, you know, here you've got this really shiny pie pan or something that is reflecting the background onto it, and you can hypothesize what that will look like, right? I guess, um, let's also look here. So there's also this great resource in California. So basically, um, you know, USC has this huge uh, institute for creative technologies. And so Hollywood, you know, goes to this group all the time, which is still an academic, you know, institution to acquire stuff for movies. So this is actually one case where academia and, and Hollywood are coming together. And this, uh, you know, organization, so Paul Debevec is the guy who was really uh, involved with this. He's a great, you know, computer graphics, computer vision researcher, but he's also got great ties into Hollywood. and so. They've got all sorts of systems there where they have these rigs of lights and cameras that are kind of, you take an actor into this environment and you light them from different angles and different colors. And so here's the example of, um, let's see, I feel sad that, uh, no, let's, let's see if this will work. For some reason, my new computer doesn't want to play video at 1280 by seven, whatever. I don't know why it's so picky about that. Um, so the idea here basically is that um, there are, as I recall, um, infrared lights that are being used to acquire maths um, kind of in real time. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be too quick to say this. Let's just see what the, uh, yeah, it is infrared, that's right. I'm sorry I didn't have this prepared uh, ahead of time here. <laughs> 
Yeah. What if you didn't break? Is this a right. Yes, exactly. So I mean, um, and actually, a lot of the initial work on matting, even back in Hollywood, had to do with spectral-based matting. So, so actually, one of the very first matting ideas had to do with uh, yellow sodium light that was at a very, very, like if you look at like astronomy images, so like there are some light sources that have like a spectrum that is like super sharp, right? And so the idea was they used the sodium light that they could easily filter out um, at the back end, right? And so basically if you just kind of looked at the fraction of yellow light that was coming on the image, you could very easily build a foreground map from that. And so this sodium light matting was one of the first things. In fact, um, that was before blue screens and green screens, that's what they did, right? Um, so let's see here if we can get some pictures. Yeah, this is a crazy detailed rig that they have. Just trying to find a... Yes, okay, so here's an idea, right? So this is basically like the images that are taken. So um, basically this is like a background image without the actor. This is like an infrared image with the actor. And this is like the visible image with the actor. And these are used in real time to pull off this map here in C, which is actually fairly good without any kind of additional uh, work. And then they composite this person in to this image. And so the, the exciting thing about this work also is that they can also uh, render the light that should be falling on the foreground object to make it look like it matches with the background. And that's one thing that's really important that we didn't talk about at all, is that you, know, you can't just peel off a foreground and stick it on a background and expect it to look good. And the reason is that the lighting plays such a huge role in how you perceive an object living in the space, right? And so really, you need to try and collect the foreground image to have the lighting on the foreground match the new background as well as possible, right? So if the lighting is coming from the left like it is in this woman here in the environment, you need to make sure that you match those things up. And so that's the idea here is that, you know, here they're predicting what should that light direction look like and they're capturing the image of the foreground with that correct light and doing the matting and doing the compositing kind of all in one seamless step. And that's pretty slick. Um, and you can see they've done lots of work on understanding you know, the response of different uh, textures and human skin to infrared light. So again, to really do this right, as they have done here, uh, takes a lot of effort and a lot of you know, custom hardware that I don't think really exists anywhere else in the world. So here, this is kind of an example of, again, as the, um, you know, the, the left-hand um, mirror balls are basically uh, capturing the lighting in the space that they want to composite the foreground onto, right? And so if you've ever seen, again, you see this a lot on special effects DVDs where there's a kind of a mirror ball that's placed in the scene, they take a picture of it, and they use that to uh, understand how does light fall onto this point in the scene. Usually you put the mirror ball at the place where you want to put the special effect so you know what the direction of incoming light is onto that thing. So this is this famous eucalyptus grove. I believe this is, uh, I want to say it's in Berkeley, I'm not quite sure. And then here, you know, this woman is being illuminated with the same light that's been collected from the eucalyptus grove, but inside this, you know, huge, you know, multifaceted polygon of lights and sources, and then put back into the collected images of that environment. Um, so it's pretty, you know, it's it's pretty interesting that they're able to do this all at once, right? Um, yes, I was right. This is Berkeley Eucalyptus Grove. So again, if you look at the website of the um, of this USC group, you know you'll see lots of really cool stuff. So here again, here you can see that the actress is kind of passing through these columns, right? So as she passes across a column, the light should be occluded on her face, and so instead of trying to create that somehow in post-production, they're actually simulating that at the time of capture, right? And so, you can, actually, if you remember, we, we saw kind of an example of people walking through a column to space in the very first kind of uh, movie matting video I showed you, and, you know, that they're not doing anything fancy for that green screen thing, but this is the way that you would do it if you really wanted to be precise. And so, you can imagine that, you know, there are probably lots of, of shots similar to this that are done for things like, you know, reshoots of movies, right? Where they've got, you know, um, 
they've got a crazy complicated set that they build somewhere. The actors are all there. They film, you know, some scene. They get back to editing. They take it to the studio, and they don't like the ending of the movie, right? So now you have to reshoot something. And how do you do it, right? Because maybe those sets no longer exist. And so the smart thing to do would be to capture the set, the, the lighting of the set, and the geometry of the set, which we'll talk about a lot towards the very end of class. So you capture the lighting of the set with these mirror balls to make sure you know how light is falling into the scene. And then if you need to do a reshoot, you can imagine taking somebody in costume into this USC you know, rig and filming them moving around and then compositing them back in on the you know, synthetic set. Right? That may be how some things are done. Certainly lots of reshoots are done on blue screen and green screen instead of actually going back out to a set. Because to my knowledge, most of the time in a movie, as soon as you're done with the set, you, know, you strike it down and it's gone. Right? So. Yeah, so interesting stuff. Um, any questions about anything? Okay, so um, so the next lecture is basically going to be starting to talk about compositing, which is you know we'll start talking about you know how do I take a mat and put it back onto an image. That part is actually really easy if you've got the mat, um, but we'll spend a lot of time talking about things like you know how do you remove wires from an image? How do you remove thicker things from an image, you know, like, you know, a crew member that's in the shot that shouldn't be in the shot? How do you get rid of that guy? Um, and also, how do you stitch together images from different scenes that need to live in the same plate? And so that's kind of where we're going next, and it should be fun. So thanks a lot. Now I have to figure out how to get rid of this.